Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Self-Publishing Roundtable. I'm your host, Adam, and I'm joined by my co-host, Lindsay Broker. Um, Trish is going to try to make it in. Um, she just did the 13-hour drive to the Indie Recon in Utah, though, and uh, I think she was driving from Washington, so not sure if she's going to be there in time or, you know, have a reliable connection or even feel like doing the show after driving for 13 hours, so... Um, so far, just myself and Lindsay and our guest. Um, Lindsay, did you want to introduce our guest tonight? Sure, I will give it a try here. Uh, uh, this is Kendra Hiley we're talking to tonight. She's uh, primarily a young adult author, though I think she has uh, her first book may have been middle grade qualified as. <laughs> I will ask her about that. And um, I don't think there have been too many young adult authors on the show, so we uh, went out of the way to get somebody that hopefully you guys will be able to learn a little bit from. And uh, she's a... Uh, her Matt Archer Monster Hunter series is what she's best known for. It's a five-book series she just finished up this year. And she uh, has also has a book that's published with Entangled, Publish Entangled Publishing. My tongue got entangled. And it's called Sidelined, a contemporary YA, YA uh, kind of a love story-ish. <laughs> I'll let her tell you more about it. And uh, she also had an agent and then decided to self-publish, so we'll get into all that good stuff. And... Uh, that's probably... Hey, Kendra, did you want to talk? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Kendra Hiley. Hello from Dallas. Um, I promise I don't have Ebola. I'm sure that's the thing that Dallas is best known for right now. Um, but yeah, I prim write primarily YA. Um, on my self-publishing side, I primarily self-publish urban fantasy and science fiction. I'm getting ready to start a new series that's kind of a mix of sci-fi and dystopian. And then um, I do traditional publishing for my contemporary YA. Um, I do have sidelined out with Entangled. Um, it's a little bit, it's, I wouldn't say after, after school special, but it's, uh, it focuses on um, prescription drug abuse. And then I've got another book that they're taking a look at right now. So fingers crossed, the one coming out probably in the next year or so. So um, I guess keep going with the bio. Um, I've been writing. Um, I've been writing pretty much my whole life. I majored in literature, but I didn't get serious about it until about 2008. And I wrote some very, very dreadful novels in a big hurry, um, and then decided I was going to, you know, sub those out and get an agent and get it sold. Didn't really have any clue about how publishing actually worked, and at that point in time, self-publishing really wasn't on the map, so I had no idea. Um, in a way that was probably good because, like I said, those first novels were dreadful, awful. Lindsay probably read at least one of them. She could probably tell you that. Um, then I found the online writer's workshop for science fiction, fantasy, and horror and found a great place to develop my craft, and that's where Matt Archer was born, actually. And I wrote Matt Archer, gosh, over 2009 and 2010. Um, got the idea from a, uh, from a YA writer at a conference who was talking about Twilight, which was really big at the time, and saying, you know, this is the real problem with YA literature. It's really geared toward girls right now. You know, girls love a, a vampire who is you know, misunderstood and just wants friends. Guys just want to see you kick vampire ass. So I thought, well, I've got an eight-year-old son who's a big-time reader. What's he going to read after he grows out of Percy Jackson? And so I started Matt Archer. Um, like Lindsay said, that first book kind of straddles the line between middle grade and young adult. Matt's 14, and you typically see middle grade, um, middle grade main characters tend to be 13 or 14. A little darker. It's got a little more language than your typical middle grade. And um, so when I went to market with it, my agent signed me. Publishers were saying, hey, we really like the writing. We like the character. We think it's unique. Here's the problem. It either needs to be brought back to Matt being age 12 and, you know, water it down a little bit so it can be middle grade, you know, or you need to turn Matt into a girl. I didn't really like either of those options. <laughs> so we continued to sub it out. We continued to get good feedback. Or we just think we can sell it. So after Lindsay had been having some success self-publishing, I thought, well, you know, maybe this is a good idea. Maybe I can do this. And at that point, I you know, took a leap of faith. I parted ways with my agent. I left the, you know, typical, usual, traditional path behind, and I, uh, I decided to self-publish that book. 
and it turned out to be one of the best decisions I've ever made. I've gotten a, a pretty decent sized audience by now. Um, you know, I typically on a release week, I see a, a ranking usually in the low 2000s. So, you know, it's, I'm moving some books and it's, you know, it's great. And I have some regular fans who write to me and, um, you know, on my fan page and um, send me emails and stuff. So that's pretty cool. So it turned out to be a good decision for me. Awesome. Um, we're definitely going to pump you here a little bit later on some of the things you did for marketing, but um, maybe a little bit. Uh, I appreciate you doing your own bio there, too, by the way. I like it when I don't have to ask any <laughs> questions or anything. I was going to ask those questions anyway. But um, I was just curious, why why YA? Um, you know, what what is it that, where's the appeal that makes you want to write to that audience? Yeah, this is... Um this is something a lot of people ask me is like why would a 40 something woman want to you know write for teens um, it, I, I read a lot of YA it was an emerging kind of idea when I was a teenager but there wasn't a whole lot of it so at a young age I started reading hard-boiled mysteries and thrillers and things like that um, so by the time I was you know 17 or 18 I was reading Patricia Cornwell and you know all those good books um, but when I had my son, I was still trying to read those, and you know, it, it was it was a kind of a strange experience. You know, I'm sitting there with this tiny newborn trying to read about a serial killer, and I thought I can't read this anymore. And at that point, I rediscovered my love of Tolkien, and from there, I started picking up Harry Potter. I started picking up a few other things in the YA space, and that's the point at which I realized that's really where my heart would lie. Um, I like the wonder, I like the exploration, I like that everything is new for a teenager, the you know, emotions are very intense, you know, some people don't like reading YA because there's a lot of angst, but for me it's all about that discovery and it's the first time you're feeling something and it's everything is just, you know, huge and um, trying to capture that passion and capture that world view is pretty exciting for me. Oh, great. And it, it's, it's, it's interesting to me how many adults are actually enjoying the YA, too. Did you uh, have adults in mind at all when you were writing, or just were you thinking of writing for kids? Yeah, when I first started writing, I was thinking of writing for my son, um, who's now 13 and a half and probably one of Matt's biggest fans. Um, but come to find out, you know, as I'm putting the book out, a lot of the people who are the most outspoken readers of my work are adults. In fact, I had a grandma write me <laughs> to say that she really enjoyed the first book, bought a copy for her 14-year-old grandson, and couldn't wait for him to read it so they could talk about it. Awesome. And um, I guess last question here for the intro. Um, do you find anything challenging, maybe more challenging about writing YA? I, I think there's kind of a misconception that writing for kids is easy or, you know, writing, it's not as hard as writing for adult, adults. Yeah, I think I would say there are some things. Um, you have to, romance is hard. Um, you have to focus a lot on the feelings. You can't get too graphic. You know, even if you do decide to have, you know, sex in the book, it's got to be curtained down pretty soon. Um, and you have to be very careful about how you frame it. Um, you know, there's a way of, of having to make sure that you capture that teenage viewpoint without sounding condescending or like you're, um, you know, not giving it much credence because what a teenager wants more than anything is to be taken seriously. So if any time they catch the slightest whiff of something false, they're going to put that book down and walk away. So the real challenge is how do I tell this story in their voice and make it as realistic as possible, even when to an adult some of their decisions may seem like, oh my God, why did you just do that? You have to think like a teenager and think, okay, I have all this knowledge as an adult to know that that's not the best idea, but would a 17-year-old guy know that? Or would a 16-year-old girl know that? And that's the real challenge of being able to write realistically and not seem like you're being condescending, but also being able to capture kind of what an actual teenager would do. All right, yeah, it does, it does sound like a, a, it can be a challenge. And um, Although I would say that I've definitely read adult characters that do stupid things that... <laughs> <laughs> A 14-year-old child, or not, a four-year-old yeah. child would uh, know not yeah. to do this. But, well, and that's uh, the hard thing, too. You can't have a teenager act like a 40-year-old. So, you know, having someone that's too adult is not, as, is not realistic either. Yeah, I imagine that having kids kind of helps you stay grounded in that world a little bit. I would find it hard, especially for contemporary stuff. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I have a chance to do that through my kids, plus I volunteer with some youth groups for high school age students, and so I have an opportunity to, you know, kind of experience what they're experiencing and, you know, hearing how they talk. <laughs> you don't want to use a lot of slang, but if you use any, you want to make sure it's realistic, so, um, so I'm lucky to have that kind of opportunity. All right, well, I'm going to send you over to Adam now, and he's going to kind of talk about the craft stuff with you and find out what your process is like. Awesome. All right, so um, I guess where I'll start off with is sort of a question. You said that, um, of course, been writing just about ever. You said you also majored in literature, I believe you said, um, but you really honed things in an online workshop. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, actually, that's how I met Lindsay. Um, there's a really great online writer's workshop for um, people with writing genre fiction. And I found it because an agent that I've been following mentioned it and mentioned that you know, several writers had come out of this workshop with just some really good stuff. So I knew I needed to find a critique group, but I wasn't in a place, you know, my children were young, and it just wasn't a, a good time for me to try and find something local where I'd go and have to read in front of people, plus that just freaked me out. Um, so finding something that was online where I could critique for someone and then they would critique in return seemed like a really good idea. Um, and I met a lot of really great writers um, on that site, as long as, as well as some people who are excellent readers and editors. Um, you know, so I would say if you're just starting out or if you're not sure where to find something, there are a lot of great online um, critique groups that have started in the last three to five years that, you know, if you're on the lookout for that, just do a search and I'm sure you'll find a lot of them. Awesome. And um, you also mentioned that um, a lot of the YA stuff was geared towards girls and that you wanted one that was maybe more geared towards uh, boys. So it is. Is your series specifically geared toward um, male audience, male uh, young adult readers, or did you try to make it kind of ambiguous for everyone? Um, I would say that when I started out, I saw Mad Archer as more geared toward a male audience. Um, I mean, it's about a high school kid who hunts monsters with the army. <laughs> so, I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot of military stuff in it. There's a lot of, you know, silly humor, and there's some... You know, it's, it's, it's kind of a horror novel, so it's got some gross out moments in it, too. So I did gear it more toward what I thought a guy would like, but funny enough, there's just enough romance in it and just, you know, some good family dynamic and character development that I do happen to have a lot of female readers, too, because over the series I was kind of able to build in and tie in that family dynamic, tie in the romance piece, and then still keep all the explosions and the chases and the things like that that the guys like to read. Right. And um, the next question we had is, and this is always kind of a, not necessarily a debate, but kind of a hot topic between people that plot out completely or, you know, completely pants the novel. Um, so what, what's your process there? Do you plot out, do beats, or how, how do you? I'm laughing because Lindsay's probably rolling her eyes right now. Um, I am a, I'm trying very hard to be a reformed pantser. Um, I, I am totally a pantser. I do try very hard to outline. I um, haven't really you know, been able to stick with it too much. I find it so much easier to outline my contemporary novels than I do for my um, urban fantasy and sci-fi, and I don't know why that is. I think I just like kind of the organic buildup of the story. Um, but I do try to, I do always know where I'm going to start, where I'm going to end, and kind of the high points of the novel before I start. But Sometimes it's a mystery of how I'm going to get there, and it does end up causing me quite a bit of rewriting, so I am trying to get better about outlining and trying to do a chapter by chapter, but for me it's still kind of a process and not something I've mastered yet. So for those people listening that um, also you know, don't do any plotting, um, or maybe like you just have the major points that they're trying to get to and they, they get stuck, uh, do you have any advice for them, or is that something you're still trying to get over as well? Um, you know, I would say that for me, sometimes just the writing is the thing. And if I write myself into a corner or if I've written something and I have to go back and delete it and put in a different scene, for me, it's not, for me, it doesn't feel like it's that big a problem because I, I want to explore those characters any, anywhere, uh, anyway. And, you know, if I have to take something out, I might be able to use that idea later. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that I took out of early novels that I ended up recycling into later novels. So 
you know, for me, it, it, it doesn't bother me quite so much, but I know when I'm on a deadline, it's it's not the best thing in the world, so I try to stay more focused, but when I have kind of the time to work through something, the extra writing or the rewriting is, for me, just kind of almost therapeutic for the story. All right, and uh, that seems like how a lot of people either talk to you now. They, they're, um, like you said, they're trying to be reformed pantsers, so, um, <laughs> so everyone's kind of on that same boat, so. And um, you mentioned hitting some deadlines, so um, that kind of segues pretty nicely here. So when you first started writing, I believe you said your son was pretty young, eight or nine, is that right? Writing the novels? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and um, we'll get into more like when you started going full-time and stuff um, in the next segment in the marketing and stuff and publishing section, but I did want to talk about the schedule that you keep for writing. So um, what does your writing schedule look like right now? Do you write every day, you know, five days a yeah. week? Yeah. Um, so I do, I am still working, so I am still a part-time writer, um, but right now the way I typically do things is if if work allows, sometimes I'll write a little bit over lunch, but as of late, it hasn't really. So typically what I do is I'll get, you know, an hour or two in in the evenings, but Saturday and Sunday are really my heavy days, and it's kind of something that we've worked out with my family where, you know, Saturday and Sunday afternoons are my writing time, and I'll go into my little writing cave where I am right now, and I'll spend, you know, four, five, six hours cranking stuff out. Um, during the week, I really use that time to refine things, to you know, do a little bit of plotting, which I do, um, and also to, um, you know, put down a few extra words, especially if I'm close to finishing off a chapter, I'll wrap things up. But Saturday and Sunday, um, I would say, are really my primary days where I spend a lot of time cranking out a lot of words. Really interesting. Um, I just, I'm not sure why, but I, I assumed you were full-time, so that's even <laughs> more interesting. I know a lot of people that are watching um, are people are wanting to go full-time eventually yeah. and make it a full-time income. So um, hearing someone that, you know, is, is making good money now with having another full-time job is really interesting. So yeah. um, we did have a question. Um, okay. So you work full-time and, you know, you're, you're writing three or four novels a year uh, with kids ar around. So you already kind of talked about how you divide up the week. Um, what what kind of writing speed is that? I mean, I know you said you do five or six hours on the weekend. Yeah. How many works does that equate to? Um, I will say it depends on the day. Um, you know, I've I've had a day where I was on a rightcation and I put down nine thousand words in a day. Um, usually on my typical Saturday and Sunday, if I'm really kind of in the heart of the story and cranking it out, I'm I'm putting out twenty five hundred to three thousand words a day. Um, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. But I think the fastest I've ever, I think the fastest I've ever written is I've written, oh I don't know, like nearly a thousand words in an hour. So I mean, I, when I get going, I go pretty quickly. I type fast, and as long as the story's flowing, I can go pretty fast. Awesome. So you're putting out a lot of words a week, even with a full-time job. So that should be really, <laughs> you know, hopeful for a lot of people. Um, another question we had, kind of um, backtracking a little bit on the, talking about YA a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So writing for a YA audience, I know you said a lot of the people that are reading um, are adults, but for, I mean, you start out writing for your son, so is yeah. there anything special that you do with um, the length of the novels or chapter length or anything like that to, you know, a lot people are saying that YA attention span may be, you know, less. So you, you yeah. can't really explain things for a long time. So is there anything special you do geared towards YA? Or? Absolutely. Um, a couple of things. Even though, you know, the Mad Archer books got progressively longer, um, even the last one wasn't as long as Order of the Phoenix, not even close. Um, so I do keep my, you know, my longest book in that series was 92,000 words. So for an urban fantasy, that's not, you know, a tome. Um, and the shortest one was about 75,000 words. So I do try to keep it fairly trim. I do try to keep the action moving as much as possible. I mean, there's not a lot of times where I do a very long section of exposition or anything like that. I try to do a lot more um, discovery through internal monologue, through conversations and observations, but there's not any point where the, where the narrator is just kind of talking for a long period of time. Um, in older YA, you can get away with that a little bit more. I mean, I have a little more exposition in Unstrung, which is the new book that I've got coming out um, next week. 
but um, typically for the Mad Archer stuff, I kept it short and sweet. My chapters were rarely more than 2,500 words. Um, sometimes they were, you know, if I had a big action scene I didn't want to break up, they could get a little longer. But, you know, if you're in the heat of the action, they, they're going to read faster anyway. But I do try to keep things pretty concise. You know, they, you don't want long, flowery passages. I've always said I'm kind of a Hemingway author versus, you know, somebody who's more flowery. So that kind of lends itself well, too. But, yeah, it's kind of a get to the point and keep moving kind of writing style. Right, and um, so you were just talking about narrator a little bit. So with your books, um, is it, what point of view is it? Is it first person? I know most yes. YA that I've seen is, it is, okay. Yeah, uh, um, the Matt, Matt Archer's first person um, passed, but this is going to probably hack some people off, and Strong is first person present. And I didn't set out to write the book that way, it just happened that way. My um, character was just speaking in present tense, and I tried to switch it to past, and it wouldn't. I'm like, screw it, I'm going with it. Yeah, I, I'm sure that'd be kind of jarring for a couple of people. I know I would be like, what? Yeah. Um, so when you're writing it um, first person from you know a, a young uh, kid's point of view, did you channel your son into that, or how did you get into that mindset? <laughs> A little bit of channeling my son into that, you know, just listening to how, you know, some of the teenagers I, I work with talk and interact, um, you know, watching, unfortunately, I'm subjected to a lot of Nickelodeon and, and uh, Disney Channel shows, um, but also just channeling kind of my own inner teenager and remembering kind of how all of those thoughts and feelings were just kind of always rolling in your head and nothing ever felt certain and everything was just kind of always, always in the spot to see your pants, always in the moment. Um, so just kind of thinking like that helps as well. We kind of have a related question as well. Um, so someone asked as far as um, with characters and uh, maybe not so much plotting but planning, um, how do you plan out your character arcs, especially with it being from a teenage character's perspective? So teenagers can be hard-boiled and stubborn as they can, impressionable, and I'm just curious how you go about um, planning out your characters, major plot points, life-changing events, etc. Right. So that that's, you know, there's a really different way you do that when you're talking about an urban fantasy versus a contemporary YA. Um, so I'll deal with the contemporary YA first because that's in some ways almost a little easier. Um, when you're dealing with a contemporary YA, usually there's some inciting invent that they're dealing with um, for sidelined. Um, my my main character was a basketball star, and she had college prospects, and she had a very domineering mother who wanted her to succeed at the sport that she didn't, you know, succeed at. And so, at the state tournament, she breaks her leg, and so now I'm dealing with this character whose entire life and her entire dream are just flat gone. So you put yourself in that very second and ask yourself, what is this person going through and what's going to happen? And they start to make bad decisions. And so, you know, you know when you hit that exciting event, okay, knowing this character's personality, how would they handle this? Well, in Jenna's case, she started taking a little extra Vicodin to make things kind of smooth out because her head was not in the right place. And as a teenager, you know that sometimes they make risky choices, especially when they're faced with something so traumatic. Um, so just for me, for the contemporary YA, it's take that, take that inciting event and then draw out the most logical conclusion and let them kind of walk that path. Um, for urban fantasy, and, and for some, in some respects, the science fiction stuff, well, the science fiction stuff is really, at least the stuff that I write is really about who am I, what am I. Um, so trying to help a person who's already in a state of, I don't really know who I am, who's thrown into a situation that calls that even more into question, you know, a lot of self-doubt, a lot of angst, a lot of soul-searching, a lot of dark nights of the soul. Um, you know, they are stubborn and they don't want to believe certain things, and they make mistakes. And that's the biggest part of YA is you've got to let them make those mistakes so that they can grow into a different person. Um, for the urban fantasy, for Matt, you know, he's kind of, he's almost a little perfect. Um, he does have his faults, but one of his, one of, you know, his character trait is that he's just a darn good kid, and he's doing what he has to do because it's been, 
put on his shoulders and he's not going to shirk that responsibility and part of that was born out of, out of the fact that his father left them you know when he was a baby so he's always taken too much on himself and he is impressionable he does have um, an uncle in his life who is everything to him and he'd do anything to emulate him and so their relationship is a little bit interesting in that at any point in time when you know, Uncle Mike might not do exactly what Matt thinks he should do. That's like a stop point for Matt. It's like, what just happened? Why is my, you know, why is my world suddenly different? But, um, you know, you just, I think for writing about teenagers, it's a lot like writing for adults, except you have to realize that the emotional roller coaster is much, much more volatile, is that you figure out what's going to change, and then you set them on the path, and then you have to think like a teenager, they're not going to have that experience how are they going to get from point A to point B? Perfect. And um, so that kind of brought up another question in the comments as well. I know you touched on the romantic elements a little bit. You said you had enough in there sprinkled in um, to you know, make it readable for maybe young girls that are looking for more of the romantic yeah. side of things. And we had a question um, that wanted to know a little bit more detail on how you um, handled the romantic elements of the books. I know you said that you kind of do, uh, if there's any sexual content, you do sort of the black screen. Um, but, you know, how do you handle it leading up to it, that part of it, and have you had any lashback from uh, maybe people that didn't expect that at all in a YA book? Yeah, so um, I set out to the beginning that Matt was going to be somewhat like Harry Potter except darker and a little more grown up, that Matt was going to age. And I, I even have an author's note in all of my listings on Amazon that say this is intended for an audience of age X because I don't want, you know, I did get some complaints from usually from older people who are reading these things to their grandchildren, which I'm like, no. Um, but for, for that kind of thing, if you're talking about YA, now there are some YAs, the older YAs, and especially if you get into new adult, but older YA, you can push that envelope pretty far. I mean, there are some older YAs that get fairly graphic. I don't write those kind of YAs. I don't mind them at all. It doesn't bother me. But um, for me, I'm writing a slightly, you know, slightly younger set or wanting a younger reader set. So since I'm not focusing on a reader set that's 18 or 17, I'm focusing on a reader set that's 14 or 15. Um, what you really have to do is focus on the feels, the feelings. How are they, you know, it's not the actual mechanics of what's going on, it's how they feel. What are they thinking? What's their, you know, is, how is their heart beating? Can they, you know, are they just astonished this is happening? Are they confused? Are they, you know, what are they feeling in that moment? And know when to stop. So you get to a point where, you know, it's this big romantic scene, you're talking about all these feelings, and then you have to know to trail off, drop the curtain so that the reader knows what's going on, and then bring the curtain up much later, like, hours later so that you get the thoughts of what happened you know okay my life changed in this very very fundamental way you know in Matt's case I mean he's a guy and you know he, his thought is he's like grinning like an idiot because he just you know <laughs> this is a big deal right um, but you have to be very careful about how far you know depending on the age of the audience you want to focus on where you drop that curtain but you know for me I let my son read these books. I mean, so for me, it's a little bit, you know, I'm a little more liberal perhaps than other people, but I do make sure that I have a, you know, because I am a parent, I do make sure I have a warning on Amazon that says this is not intended for readers under the age of 14. Um, and, you know, and I also make sure that I don't put anything that's too graphic in there. Perfect. And uh, so we have one last question, and then we'll kind of switch over to Lindsay to talk more about the publishing and marketing side of stuff. So um, the last thing is you said that you, um, I think you said all of your novels are right now um, are YA, but you have some that are sci-fi, fantasy, and some that are kind of contemporary. Um, are those still aimed at kind of the exact same age group, same kind of uh, age pro protagonist, and uh, do a lot of the same considerations for, you know, one genre bleed into the other because they're both YA, or, or is it pretty different between the two? I would say it's a little bit different um, and I would even say that Unstrung, the sci-fi one, is different even from Matt. Um, even though Matt got older and the books got definitely darker, it's still 
skewed a little bit younger. I mean, the you know the typical reader for that fifth book, I would say it's probably appropriate for a 14 or 15 year old, even though it's pretty dark. But the the thing you have to understand is a lot of people don't understand that a lot of teenagers are already seeing this stuff and darker. So you kind of have to be able to judge what modern teenagers really are experiencing. <laughs> Um, but I would say that Unstrong is for an older audience, not because it's any more graphic. Um, actually, there's you know less language and less you know even less sexual content in this first book than the other, but more because of the age of the um, main character. She's 17, um, and because of the really kind of the maturity and the sophistication of the actual story itself. You know, no matter how many elements you bring in and, you know, base it in whatever you want for Mad Archer, it's still kind of an action adventure and it's still kind of a horror book. Um, Unstrung is more of a cyberpunk. I mean, you don't see a lot of that in YA, so I avoid calling it that. I call it more of a dystopian because it is, but a cyberpunk is a dystopian. But I've been telling people who are kind of more science fiction oriented that it's a kind of, I would call it a mix of Team Blade Runner and the movie Sneakers, if anybody's seen the movie Sneakers, um, because it's about a thief. She's a thief. Um, so given that storyline, this automatically skews toward kind of an older readership. Sidelined is clearly, at least in my opinion, for readers 15 and up. Um, there's language in it. There's some tough subjects in it. There's romantic con uh, content in it because, uh, you know, Entangled is a romance publisher, so there's some there's a strong romantic hook to it. So clearly to me, that's for somebody who's in high school. Um, but, you know, it, I think it, it can depend on the language and the adult content, but what I really think it depends on more is the sophistication of the type of story that you're trying to tell. All right, perfect. So, yeah, and um, so a quick comment, you know, like you said, kids know a lot more about a lot sooner than parents really think. So, you know, I, I think it would be bad in YA for sure to kind of talk down to the audience for sure. So, um, all right. So now we'll go over to Lindsay, and she's going to talk to you a little bit about uh, marketing and publishing. All right, I'm back, and you know, I just I think I've told Kendra this before, but I distinctly remember finding the Clan of the Cave Bear books when I was 12. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, they may have a mammoth being hunted on the front, but those are some dirty books. Mm -hmm. So you never know what your kids are reading. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, I would love to talk about the publishing and especially the marketing side of things. And I actually I forgot to show you earlier. I have something here. <gasps> Oh. Cider, caramel, cider, apple, dark chocolate, truffles, and I will personally bring them to you if you do an awesome job today. And you're uh, doing good so far. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> but uh, so I, I'm most curious about the marketing, but uh, I think we should probably talk about, you know, I know when you decided to uh, go out on your own and do uh, Matt Archer's was your first, I believe, and you knew you were going to do a series. What were you kind of, what was your plan going for publishing, like with cover art? Were you just kind of looking at what's popular in that crowd? Or, um, you know, what was kind of your strategy, I would say? Yeah, so um, I, through you, of course, I found the amazing Streetlight Graphics. Um, but I, I looked at a lot of YA covers, and uh, particularly in that kind of area to get a look and feel for what the Big Five was doing. Um, and I knew I wanted kind of a certain look and feel. I wanted it to be almost a little bit B-movie, you know, kind of splashy, lots of color to get some, you know, especially for a younger reader, that's the kind of thing that really gets their attention, right? So um, so I really wanted something that kind of fit within that YA space in terms of how it looked um, and, you know, spent a lot of time combing through covers. And I actually did that for every cover that I've had. I've gone out and looked at various covers in that space and thought, okay, this is what I'd really like to see, and oh, I like this font on this one a little better, or I like, you know, this, you know, take take this element out, add this element in, but I wanted to make sure that it kind of was in the same, you know, kind of crowd as those those YA books that are being published by the Big Five. Awesome, and um, you have paperbacks, I think, for all of the Matt books. Um, do you think that's, how, do you sell a lot of them? How important do you think that is, or is it more eBooks for that age group as well? It's, it's a lot of ebooks. I know a lot of people say, oh, you know, there's studies have shown that YA wants paper. Um, I can tell you that most of the teens I know read books on their phones. 
I can't personally read a book on the phone unless I'm on the treadmill. I do it when I'm on the treadmill, but I'd rather have my iPad in my hand. I mean, they're reading books on their phones. Um, in our school district, at least, they have iPads for every grade down to seventh grade. So these are, they don't even take home textbooks anymore except for math. They have textbooks online. So this is a crowd that really does read a lot of stuff ebook wise. Um, younger than about 12 or 13, yeah, they're still reading physical books, but really the major, vast majority of my cells have been ebooks. And do you find at that age group, do you need to uh, target the, I guess, teenager? as the person you're going to sell the books to, or is it still more the parents that are kind of doing the buying that you need to market to? I, I think it's a combination. Um, I think for YA, and this is true of all books, but I think YA a lot, it's a lot of word of mouth. And something that's unique about YA and to some extent to um, the romance genre, um, blog tours are actually a pretty good um, way of kind of getting out in front of a crowd because book bloggers in the YA space, especially for adult YA readers, actually do have a lot of influence. Um, so, you know, yes, there are some parents like that grandmother I told you about who read Matt Archer and gave it to their kids. Um, there are some who do read it and then give it to their kids or pick it out for their kids. But um, a lot of it really comes from word of mouth. People are saying, oh, you know, I told my friend all about this book and how he got it and now three other people got it. So that's that's more of what I'm hearing than anything else. That's interesting about the blog tours. Um, I personally found that kind of effective for getting some early reviews, but I didn't really see many sales from it. Um, you've got a lot of great reviews all through the Matt Archer series. It really seems that if you can get people to try that first one, that a lot of them will stick with it. Um, what, what have you done to try to get, you know, try to get people into that first book? Um, when I, I dropped it to 99 cents um, once I got the second book out, and I left it there for quite a bit of time, and that worked out really well. But now that the series is done, I've gone ahead and made that first book free. Um, I've done some advertisements. Um, you know, I've tried pretty much everything. I did get a book bub um, early on. And that, you know, that led to a lot of sales and a lot of pickup sales for the second book. Um, I think now, now that I know a little bit more about how BookBub works, you know, if I'm going to do another one in the future, I'm going to, especially if I do it for the Unstrung series, I'm probably going to wait until I have more than just one other book out just so I can see, you know, kind of a bigger wave from that. Um, but I do, I do run some ads. I do the book blogs. Um, and, you know, but again, I, I really think, as le at least as far as, you know, Matt's concerned, Amazon is my friend because I do think it gets recommended in some also bots, but um, I think some word of mouth is kind of what's, what's helping there. And do you pretty much use all the same advertising sites that the, the adult authors use, like the BookBub and Pixel of yeah. Ink, Kindle Nation Daily? Do you find that that's effective for why? Yeah, um, since so many adults are reading YA, um, I have had some some good success with them. I will say, Psy Pixel of Ink still hasn't picked me, but um, you know, e-reader news today, I had a really big wave from them, um, and I've had some good success with a couple of the others, like the Kindle Nation and um, you know some of the other lists outside of BookBub. I've actually had some success with Book Grillo. You know, I know a lot of people who've kind of had mixed results with them, but I've actually had pretty good sales when, when I run one of those. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I usually advertise on most of the same sites. And do you also, uh, of course, everybody now, we are told we need to have a mailing list and uh, collect the names of our readers or the email addresses so uh, when we have a new release, it, it's got some buyers right away. Do you find that with the YA crowd that they're willing to sign up for your list and do that? You know, based on my sales, I would say that my my mailing list is pretty small compared to what I think my reader base probably is. So I would say probably not as much. I do get decent traffic on my website because that's something that, you know, a younger reader would have quick access to if they have a phone or if they have an iPad or something like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't think it's such a quick update. I, I do, you know, I do have one, and I do have enough, you know, enough subscribers that it's worth sending out the newsletters. But I wouldn't say it's like a huge number. So really, for me, where I see the most traffic is doing a blog post that gets cross posted to Twitter and to Facebook and to Google and to um, Tumblr. 
um, that usually helps get the word out a little bit better for me. Yeah, I would think that that age group would kind of really be plugged into the social media. I think some of the yeah. most excited tweets I've gotten have been from like, I'm 14 and you just uh, left a cliffhanger and they're just so excited they're all in caps. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Twitter, do you think those have, uh, do you tried hard to keep a presence on Twitter and Facebook? And uh, I haven't done Tumblr at all. I'm curious about that. Yeah, that Tumblr's new for me. I just started that probably about six months ago, and so I'm kind of in my infancy there. Um, but I do, you know, the funny thing is I, I do get some really good traffic on my Facebook site and some tweets and things like that. But the funny thing is where I get the most, um, most feedback from, especially my younger fans, is the contact page on my website. I get a lot of emails from these guys. Um, I think part of that is, you know, and, and this is true of Twitter and Facebook too, but part of that is they, they want that individual interaction. They want to say, I exist, and you know I exist. And by sending me an email through the contact page, you know, I try to answer every one of those. So if they send me an email, I email them back, and I usually get an enthusiastic response almost right away. So I, I think... I think for all readers, but especially this age group, they're looking kind of for that immediate, hey, author person, I read your book, you need to know that I like you kind of thing. Yeah, I think that those have been some of my most uh, enthusiastic emails when I've gotten them. You know, they're, you're the best author ever, whereas an adult will be like, did you know you had three errors and uh, you're not <laughs> writing your mentions right? But, yeah. Um, I would ask, uh, how important do you think it was for you uh, in having a series? You know, I think, you know, I, we've talked a lot about advantages of series on uh, various podcasts, and do you think it's really helped you sell the first one and the second one by having, uh, do you do, yeah, you'll have to let us know if you do cliffhangers or. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, I would say in the YA space, um, you know, sideline just to stand alone. But, you know, that's a, that's a discrete story, but for series is really where you gained an audience. Um, I mean, you can see that in, in pop culture, Hunger Games, for example. I mean, just a huge wave, um, Divergent and the, other, the others, you know. Even, you know, you hear tales, quiet tales of authors who think they've written a standalone novel, you know, for the big five, end up having to write a series because that's what that's what YA editors are looking for as a series because most um, most young readers and a lot of adults tend to like to get invested in a character over a long series of books and once they've tried one it's tried and true and they can say great I know this author I know I'm gonna like this book so I'm gonna read this book all right I think it's definitely the way to go for sure for uh, if you want to build an audience and keep them coming back um, we got a question here that I was actually going to ask also from Kate Morgan. Are you using Wattpad at all, since it does seem to be popular with the younger readers? Yes, I have the first Matt Archer book complete out on Wattpad. I've had some good traffic. Um, I haven't had quite the traffic that some other, you know, other books do. I think probably because they like the older YA and the new adult a little more. I see a little more traffic on those. Um, but yeah, I definitely have the entire first Matt Archer book out on Wattpad. Yeah, I think I found with Wattpad that um, you kind of have to work it a little bit too. It's, yeah. it's hard to just put a book up there and hope they'll find you, and it depends how much effort you want to put into becoming popular mm -hmm. on Wattpad. Because yeah. did you find that you sold any books or had any people tell you that they first found you there? I've had one or two, but it's funny. I, I've gotten more feedback on the audiobook than I have on Wattpad. And I think you said a similar thing, is that having the first book or two of the Emperor's Ed series on audiobook has you know, gained you some readers that way. I've, I've had specific emails saying, hey, I found your audiobook. It was great. I'm, I'm buying the rest of the books, but when are the rest of the audiobooks out? And I always have to say, well... Maybe later, because they're kind of expensive to do, but I definitely think there was a lot of value in having the first one on audiobook. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think the more places you can be found, the better. And are you on Podiobooks, then, the site where they can read or listen for free? No, I'm really only on the ACX sites. Um, you know, I, I, I put it up there because I just really wanted to have one. <laughs> so I just went with kind of the kind of the path of least resistance for that one. Um, but I've heard that Patio Books does a lot of great things and gets a lot of exposure. Well, that's really cool that you're actually selling some uh, audiobooks, especially if there are people yeah. just finding you for the first time on uh, Audible. 
Have you? Uh, are you actually making some money? Can you take the family out to dinner on the? <laughs> on the yeah, audience? actually, I, you know, I, I did tease one listener and say, well, I'm I'm saving all my royalties to do book two. I might have it in about two years. <laughs> but but yeah, I'm I'm making you know it's a small income, but it's a steady income. I'm making I'm getting some sales every month or some listens every month. It seems. Cool. Congratulations. Um, I know Matt Archer is your big series, but um. Why don't we take a step over here for a second? And I'm kind of curious about uh, sidelined since you had to, uh, since it's a standalone and it doesn't sound like you're really going to do a sequel or anything. What have the challenges to marketing that been? Um, it's a little bit of a different animal since it's marketed through a publishing company. Um, I will say that being a hybrid author has been really interesting. I've learned a lot about both sides of the process by by working with them and working with their editors, um, you know, learned some ticks, tips and tricks that you know I hadn't learned. Like I had some some writing ticks that I didn't realize I had, and they kind of hammered those out of me. And so I, you know, I've seen some improvement in some of the things that I've done. Um, but yeah, I mean, for 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 one of those novels like uh, sidelined. Um, it's a little bit different in that it's very front-loaded on the marketing. So, like with Matt Archer, I can pretty much just you know buy an ad whenever I want to. Um, with the fact that the you know the company's doing it and I'm working with a publishing house, it's a little bit different. At the very beginning, when it first came out, I was everywhere. Um, I was on blog tours, I was on Twitter parties, I was you know answering interview questions and things like that and that lasted probably through probably about the first month and then after that it kind of quieted down so really for me this you know the the unstrung or unstrung sorry the sidelined marketing is more passive you know I have it on my website I talk about the book I'm very proud of the book but you know kind of the main piece of it I work with the publishing house so when they're you know when they want me to do a specific plug I do it otherwise it's just more of a passive thing now and did you find having kind of done it both ways where you just you do this big launch versus as an indie maybe you just kinda of every month doing an ad or something did you find the launch effective or did you feel like you know a lot of work and not as effective as you hoped or yeah it was it was a lot of work I mean it was fun don't get me wrong I had a blast doing it but it was a lot of work and I think that you know part part of the thing about sidelined is it's not one of those books that people buy because they want to feel good I mean it's not really it's not really just a, a totally feel-good book. It was a book that I felt was important. It was the book of my heart. But it's not something someone's going to go out and read just because, hey, I want an entertaining Friday night because it's a tough book to read. So I think that's part of the you know challenge in marketing that. Um, I mean, it is on demand for paperbacks, but it's really more the kind of book that an English teacher would read and say, you've got to read this. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't... It's really hard for me to talk about marketing that book because it is so different in terms of kind of the reader base. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it was it was a lot of work, and you know, my sales for that book aren't as strong as my indie sales. So you know, I can't really say that it was better one way or the other. All right, and for those who probably don't know, which is everyone, I've actually read a number of Kendra's books because uh, we're beta readers for each other, and that is my favorite one so far. So I think everybody should go out there and, and try. It's it's definitely more literary, I would say. It has a yeah. message. <laughs> yeah, that's it, why I call it, was it good. English teacher reading. You know, an English teacher reads it and says, "Oh, my class has to read it." <laughs> <laughs> um, so can we talk a little bit about? Um, you, you, I don't think you've ever been exclusive with Amazon. What is your kind of policy on that? How are you doing on the other vendors? What you know? What are you yeah. doing there? So I've never been exclusive on Amazon. I toyed with the idea briefly and then like had buyers remorse almost immediately. So um, I, uh, I'm doing okay. I still, the lion's share of my sales are still coming from Amazon. I think that's probably true for a lot of people um, just simply because I think Amazon's way of getting also bots and sending out the emails and saying, hey, you bought this, you might like this, just really gets books in front of people that may not have a lot of exposure in another way, and I think that the other um, other booksellers are a little less effective than that. Um, but I mean, I do steady trade. Um, I've noticed that 
and this makes me sad because I'm a Nook reader and I love Barnes and Noble, but I've noticed that my sales have been kind of up and down, up and down, and I know some of that is the um, kind of the up and down at Barnes and Noble itself with the Nook. Um, but I've seen, you know, I've seen some steady growth on Kobo. I've seen, you know, here recently I've seen some real growth on um, Apple. So iTunes is really starting to pick up, and I've got some some pickup on Smashwords too. But I've been really surprised at you know how quickly Apple's starting to grow. Yeah, it only takes a short three years, and uh, you too can be <laughs> selling an Apple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, someone wanted to know if what you do with the permafree. It kind of I think you kind of go off and on maybe a little bit there with the first book. What what do you? Th yeah. What's your strategy? Um, I went perma-free for a little while, and then I put it back on sale for 99 cents um, just to kind of jumpstart things a little bit. But now I think I've decided just to go ahead and stay perma-free, um, mainly because, well, there's a couple reasons. One, I've definitely more than made back my investment in that book. So if I can use this, you know, kind of an enticement to get people to try the series, great. Um, and just because, I mean, you know, I, I want... I want it to be accessible, and I want people to have the opportunity to read it. And especially for when you're talking about a white audience who's working off allowance, <laughs> having a, a, a free book in their category that they might like, hey, that's an easy way to get you know a younger audience who might not have the spending cash that someone else would to get a book. Yeah, it definitely. A lot of people that have been on the show have definitely had success with that, and you know I do the first perma free also. Um, I, I'm curious. One thing I wanted to ask you, because I'm going through the same thing, is what do you do when you're uh, you're done with your series? You published the last book, got great reviews, people loved it, and then but how do you keep it alive when you're not continuing to publish books? Uh, this is something I'm trying to figure out. Aside from just doing some advertising, uh, how do you keep people buying the books? Yeah, I mean, I I have some pretty active people on my Mad Archer blog. I haven't been as active there as I have been on um, the Kendra C. Hiley blog, but I I write short stories. Primarily because I want to write them. I know that sounds terrible, but sometimes I just can't let these characters go. Um, but I'll write short stories and just kind of toss them up there. Like if someone said, "Oh, I really wanted to see so and so from this point of view," and or this scene from you know somebody else, and and you know it'll spark my my creativity, and I'll you know dash out a three-page story and just throw it up on the blog, and you know that keeps my past readers kind of engaged and, and reminds them to say, hey, you know, there's this great author who keeps publishing little stories here and there, you got to try this series. Um, so I try to engage that way and then also, you know, just keep running a few ads and, you know, keep reminding people um, about the series on Twitter from time to time. Um, going perma-free helped with that because I was able to say, hey, look, now it's free. Remember the series? Tell your friends. Um, but, you know, it's just kind of just a hit and miss little thing here and there just to keep it fresh in everyone's memory. All right. That sounds like a good idea, uh, posting the short stories um, to stay excited and to keep it new. Um, so I guess I'm kind of curious. Uh, I think we should ask everybody practically this now that uh, Kindle Unlimited is out and it's been out for a couple months. As somebody, you know, you're like me, you're on the outside because you want to be in all the vendors. Um, have you, have your sales been affected? Are you trying to do anything to help if, if they have been affected? Yeah, I would say that I did see a little bit of a drop when um, KU started. Um, I, it wasn't a sizable drop, and I'm still kind of not real sure what the outcome is going to be with it. Um, plus, you know, everyone hears the rumors that, hey, they're going to let you know, everybody into KU, anybody who's in KDP will get into KU at some point or, you know, so I'm, I'm trying not to let it, you know, affect me too much in terms of making a rash decision. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think we're just going to have to wait and see because it's only been out for a little while. And so, yeah, we saw an initial drop, but what's going to be, what's it going to be like in three months? Is that going to continue or is it going to, pop back where it was as people get used to the idea of Kindle Unlimited. Yeah, it's definitely something to keep an eye on. And um, I just blanked out. I was going to ask you something. It was going to be scintillating. No. <laughs> oh, I just realized uh, we hadn't really talked too much about pricing other than that you dropped your price on the first book. And um, I was just curious what you if you've experiment, experimented much, what's a good price range for, for the YA? Sure, yeah. I mean... 
for that lead book, once you you know when you put a first book like for um, Unstrung, I'm going to price it at three ninety nine. But for the first, it's it's pre order at two ninety nine, and for the first few days, it's going to be two ninety nine, and then I'll bump it up. Um, but when you've got a series going, I find that there's some value in kind of playing with pricing with that first book. So that's why you know Matt Archer originally started at two ninety nine, but dropped to ninety nine cents and stayed there for quite a long while because I found that to be a very effective price. Point. But for different, you know, different series, that may be a less effective price point. So, you know, I, but I noticed that whenever I would bring it back up to two ninety nine, sales would just drop, and then as soon as I brought it back down to ninety nine cents, it picked right back up. So for me, it was just kind of testing every once in a while. Okay, put it at this price and leave it for just a little bit. Eh, that's not working. Put it back at the price it was. Okay, yeah, that's working. So um, I think in the YA space, less expensive is better. I mean. Um, yeah, you know, my last book in the series is four ninety nine, and it's the most expensive book I have, except for the omnibus. But that's three books in one, and um, you know, I, I I felt like since it was the longest book and the last book, um, you know, that it could command that price, and it did. Um, it did very well at four ninety nine. But really, if if I have the first two more than you know, the first one more than ninety nine cents, and the second one more than two ninety nine, I saw a, a significant drop off. So I've kind of played until I found that spot. Sounds good. Uh, it's great that, you know, I think that's a good strategy is having a, an inexpensive, inexpensive first book and then getting the 70% royalty, of course, on the following books in the series. And I think I'm about, uh, that's about all I have here for the marketing stuff that comes to mind. So I'm going to hand you back to Adam. I think he might have a couple viewer questions to kind of wrap things up here tonight. So take it away. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I grabbed a few from different places online. And I know you touched on several of these already a little bit, but I figured I'd go ahead and go through them. Um, so the first one was, I, you talked a little bit about mailing lists, how important it was to get people on there, like everyone knows now, of course, but um, I've also seen it um, mentioned by other authors that you have to be uh, careful when interacting with people that are underage or interacting with kids through email. So what kind of precaution do you take there? How do you handle that? Yeah, you really want to, you know, mine's mainly in a disclaimer, you know, you need to be 13, but really what I try to do is when I send out any newsletters, I make sure that it's, you know, not, there's nothing inappropriate, it's completely age neutral, you know, anybody could read it and say, oh yeah, that's PG, um, just to make sure there's not anything in it. Uh, you know, I think for a YA author it's a little bit easier because we're really not going to have too much content that's going to be inappropriate for a young person, but I would think that you know if you're a, a writer of adult fiction or you know perhaps romance that could get a little more sticky. So I would suggest you know make sure that you have a disclaimer that this is you know by clicking this I certify that I'm X age 16, 18, whatever you want to make it, um, and that way you're covered if you know you get an irate parent emailing you saying why did you send this to my child? Well they click the button saying they were 18, but you know that's my recommendation. Right. And um, so even not taking into account the mail list itself, if you get like a, a fan that's emailing you and they're underage, do you handle that sort of the same way? Do you let them, how do you handle that? Yeah, if I, you know, I think the youngest fan I've ever had email me was probably 14 or 15. I, I keep it, you know, very high level and professional, you know, oh, thank you so much. I mean, they really do want to hear back from you. And there's been a long historical instance of, you know, authors writing back to, you know, fan mail. So... I don't think there's a lot of restriction around that as long as you're not, you know, if it, as long as it's professional and you're not trying to engage in some kind of, you know, back and forth with them. Um, you really don't want to be in a long, you know, email back and forth with someone who's that age. You really just want to kind of acknowledge that they emailed you and thank them and, um, and then kind of let it be that. Right, and um, another one we had was specifically on um, what year? What year did you first publish? And then, how were things starting out? Like, how were uh, were sales really slow coming in? Um, how long until you had a sequel going? And uh, did did sales not really start until you had sequels out? How did that go in, in the beginning? Yeah. So um, I was lucky in that I I signed with my agent in 2010 for the first Matt Archer book, and I had started writing the second one. So I already had the second one drafted by the time I made the decision to self-publish. Um, I published the first one in August of 2012. 
Um, I went ahead and had a professional editor look at it. I had some beta readers reread it for me just to make sure I'd made some good story choices. Um, and then I, you know, while I was working on getting that published, I immediately started working on that second book and tightening it up and getting it ready to be read and edited. Um, and so I was able to get ahead and publish that second book six months later and then publish the third book six months later. So I was kind of lucky that I already had a trail of where I was going. Um, I didn't really hit like brand new material with, you know, people kind of saying, where is it, where is it, until I hit book four. So <laughs> I was kind of lucky that I was far enough ahead. But, um, you know, when sales suddenly caught and that was right at that third book, I know people say, oh, is that third book the magic book? I don't know if that's actually true for everyone, but it was for me. Um, that third book came out. The first, the first book, the sales were very slow at first. So if you're having that and you're getting good reviews and you're getting some churn, don't give up. Keep writing because if you're getting good reviews and you're getting churn, it may just be that you haven't had a chance to catch on because the rest of the series isn't done yet. Sales picked up a little bit for that second book. I was still getting good reviews. I started to get just a little trickle of you know emails here and there. And then when that third book hit, I'll never forget it. I put it out. I had people asking me where it was the day I said I would publish it. And I was on an airplane. You know, I was like, oh, I'll just put it out that night. Nobody's really waiting for it. And I get off that airplane and I had, I had people on my Facebook page going, where is it? I'm looking for it. Where is it? So I realized, crap, I'm actually, you know, people are actually waiting for this. And I remember publishing it, exhausted, went to bed and woke up the next morning. And I'm like, in the last 12 hours, I've sold 75 books. What happened? I'd never had, I'd never sold that many books in that short a time frame at that point. And I, for me, it was just kind of like that magic number. And sales for each new release have been really good. So um, I think that's kind of, kind of where I hit. So don't give up. Keep going. And then uh, kind of segueing off that pretty decently. The, the next question is actually about reviews. And you were talking about, you know, getting good reviews, but not many. Um, so, you know, what did you do to get reviews in the beginning? Do you think those were really instrumental as well? Was it really hard in the beginning, or? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I know, and I, I'll speak to other YA authors that I know too. For me, it was the blog tour really helped. Um, I, I really believed in the book. I knew, you know, I, I felt like it was a good book. So I, even though I was nervous, I'm like, I'm going to go ahead and let bloggers take a look at this. So I went with a blog tour company. Um, you know, it's not expensive. It sounds expensive, but it really isn't. Um, reading Addiction, by the way, if you're looking for one. Um, and they set up a, you know, 20 stop tour. I got like 12 reviews out of it and they were all really good. And then I noticed after that sales started picking up a little. And once the ice is kind of broken on those reviews, you have a few reviews already there. It seems like people are less worried about putting reviews once there's, once there are already reviews out there. Now, and I, I see this with Lindsay's a lot because it cracks me up. Now people are like, I got there first. I reviewed it first. Um, but you know, in the, in the beginning, it's kind of hard. You need to you need to have a way to break that ice and get some reviews out there. And a blog tour is good. I know some people who have had excellent success with Goodreads. Um, there are some forums. Um, as, as I know for sure for YA where you can give the book away to a number of Goodreads readers. And I know somebody who got like a hundred reviews that way. Um, so, I mean, if you're brave, you can do, you know, and you really believe in your book, you can do it that way too and, and not end up spending anything. But, you know, does it lead to sales sometimes? Um, but for me, you know, it's more about the exposure, the more times a reader sees your cover. I mean, I even had somebody comment on this, you know, I saw your cover, gosh, seven or eight times and I finally broke down and bought it and I love your books. So, I mean, the more you can get it out there, the better chance you have someone trying it. Yeah, that's pretty impressive, getting 100 reviews on, um, I mean, I know you said it was someone else that did that through a form or something, and 100 reviews on a, on a starter book is uh, it's really crazy. So mm -hmm. um, let's see, the next one, not sure how much in detail you want to go about this. I know you mentioned, um, even on the first book, you had it professionally edited and everything. Um, there was someone asking about, uh, worrying about, like, initial investment on their first book and, and try, wanting to put it out without spending very much. So. Um, was that something that you worried about in the beginning, or were you always planning on kind of, you know, doing it completely professionally and then putting it out there and yeah. hope you earn back? Yeah, I, I always had the mindset that I was going to try and make it as good, you know, professionally as good as I could. Um, 
So I, I invested in it like it was a small business. Um, you know, paid someone to help me set up a website because I knew nothing about WordPress at the time. Now I do, you know, now I get in the code on WordPress. I mean, you get good at this stuff on your own, but, um, you know, I, I, I paid for a good cover. I paid for, you know, the website. I, you know, I made sure I had a professional edit it. I, at, from the very beginning, I treated it like a small business, and most small business owners lose money their first year. And so the fact that I, you know, finally started making some money back within the first year. I'm like, okay, just like a small business. So that's that's how I treated it. I know that's that's hard for some people to do. I was lucky in that I was able to invest in it that way, but that's kind of the mindset I had. All right, and uh, I know we're past the hour by a little bit. We do have just uh, three more questions. Are you good with staying on and answering sure. them? Yeah, that's fine. All right, good. Um, so the next one was uh, you, so you have figured out um, finished up your main series, is that right? Yeah, I finished up my first series in July. Um, I released it on the 4th of July weekend, and those people who know the series kind of like that. I mean, because since it had a military vent to it, it just seemed like, you know, 4th of July just seemed like the right time to do that. Um, and then I have the new series starting, the first book drops on the 17th. Okay. And the, the question, why I wrote that up, was um, someone asked if you... Um, plan to experiment or had already experimented with either other genres or pen names and if you did um, how is how hard is it to kind of get out of the YA mindset? <laughs> um, so far I haven't experienced or, or done anything in another genre or pen name. Um, I mean I've thought about it and if I ever decide to write adult fiction I will go with a pen name just because if I do I want to be able to compl be completely free to write what I want and not have irate parents saying, my kid bought your, you know, bought your book and it was full of all this, you know, like noir mystery or whatever. Um, but so far, I just really enjoy the YA space so much that that's where I've stuck. All right, and um, so you also mentioned a couple times that, you know, you're still, this is still just part-time at the moment. Um, is, is your goal to become full-time or you want to become full-time or...? You know, this is the dream, yes. Um, this is going to sound kind of odd maybe to a lot of people. I love my current job. So for me, um, being able to split the time between the two would be the absolute heaven, you know. So if at some point I could reduce my hours and write more, that would make me really, really happy. <laughs> so that's kind of like the step two dream, and then the step three dream at some point is to write full time. But I think for now, if I can get to a point where, you know, I have the time and ability to to reduce my hours at work and write, you know, more, that would be great. Yeah, for sure. You're you're already lucky. Like you said, it's really rare for someone to say, "Oh, I don't I don't want to quit to write. I, I like my job fine." So. <laughs> I know I know I know that's weird, and it sounds it sounds weird. But I also think about Jeff Kinney. If anybody knows Jeff Kinney, that the lore is that for a long time, even though he was worth millions from the Wimpy Kid Diary of a Wimpy Kid, he still kept his day job because he wrote so well at night. He was scared to quit because he was worried it would throw off all of his creativity. So he worked at his day job even though he'd made millions from that series. I didn't know that either. My, my wife's read those actually. Speaking of adults reading YA, she's read those. <laughs> and, uh, I haven't, but I didn't know that either. Um, so the very last thing, um, so you wrapped up your Matt Archer series and um, I know you're starting a new series, but are you also, you mentioned short stories a little bit to kind of keep the old series fresh, but are you planning on any spin-offs? Do you have any of those bouncing around? That yeah, I, I do have an idea for one kind of standalone spinoff. I'm not sure I'm going to tell anybody what it's about yet, um, mainly because some of it's a spoiler, but um, I do have an idea there. It's just, um, you know, I've told a couple of people about it, and it, it would be kind of emotional for me to write it right now, so I'm going to table that for a little while, but I really do enjoy the little one-off short stories. At some point, I may put together a little anthology of some things that I've written, um, mainly because a lot of the characters in the book have a lot of rich stories of their own, and it would be neat to look at their stories outside of Matt's arena. All right, I'm not sure if I'm breaking up a little bit. You're in. I got a little tag there, but I understood, so it's all good. Um, <laughs> so, all right, that was all the questions on here. I think we pretty much went through everything.
um, printing every kind of rings on it. Mister, like that. Are you guys breaking up? I think I see Adam also is breaking up for me. I never know if it's me or him or what because I live out in the sticks. Everyone knows, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe it looks like he might have froze up there. That's too no. bad. He's running the show. <laughs> yeah, I was now he's moving. <laughs> We'll just have to sit here and talk about these chocolates that I think you've earned these today, Carmel. Oh my gosh, look how many are in there too. Oh, I'm so happy. Oh, actually, it could be just that the box is bigger this year. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh no, it says there's six. <gasps> six? Not four? Yeah, it's just good because so the excited. price went up. <laughs> they might be smaller though. You open it and there's like this little teeny thing in there. Uh, uh, um, I don't know if I should try to wrap up the show here if I... Uh, yeah. Well, I, I guess that it's... Oh. Can you hear me okay again now? Or? Yeah, we have you now. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Um, like you said, you live out in Little Nowhere, so do I, so it was cutting out some. So, um, But I'm good now? Can you hear me? You're good. All right. Um, so, like I said, I think we went through everything, but was there anything that we missed or anything extra that you wanted to put out there before we wrap things up? Talking to me? Yeah. <laughs> I think Kendra should talk about her new release that's coming out here in about a week. Just a little teaser. Yeah. Um, so Unstrung, like I said, is kind of a mix of um, Blade Runner and sneakers um, with a little bit of Pinocchio thrown in. Um, I have a, a actually a trailer. That was something new I did this time, and it was really fun, I have to tell you. I did a book trailer for this one. Um, but it's available for pre-order, and if you're interested, you can go to my website. Um, it's Kendra C. Hiley, and that's um, Hiley with an L-E-Y, dot com. And I've got, you know, first chapter teaser, and I've got a trailer, um, and the cover's out there for you to take a quick look at, too, if you're interested. Sounds okay. good. And, uh, go ahead. Sorry, Adam. I was just going to say, people can also get Matt for free right now, the first one. So. I know. It's free. <laughs> She's okay with you buying those older books, too. That's totally cool. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the first in your series looks like it's free right now, so people can pick that up. And uh, can you let people know where best to find you, where to get in contact with you, where to get your books? Um, so best way to find me, I'm, I'm on Twitter a lot. Um, so I think my Twitter address is up on the website. And to get book news, best way to find me is either Facebook or my website, kenderchiley.com. Um, but yeah, I mean, love to hear from you. I've got a contact page. If you have more questions that we didn't get to tonight, you're welcome to send me those questions through the contact page, and I'll be happy to answer them the best I can. All right. Well, we I really appreciate you coming on. I know it wasn't, uh, you know, it was pretty short notice, so I'm glad you could make it. <laughs> um, and I know a lot of people were maybe getting a little bit tired of hearing romance every week, so I was really excited <laughs> to have someone non-romance on. Um, so we will have the after party tonight. Um, Kendra, if you want to go to it, you can as well. Um, okay. And then next week's show, um, the 68th show, it's actually not going to be an interview. It's going to be the first week of um, a new format thing that we're trying. So if everyone wants to come uh, next week, you know, same time, same place, we're going to have a hot topic roundtable um, involving uh, Unlimited. And we have a couple different authors kind of on both sides of the fence You've tried it, loved it, and you've tried it, and you know not so much, um, including uh, Mimi Strong, uh, Wayne Stinnett, um, who's a really big um, believer in Kindle Unlimited. I know that he's always been um, exclusive with Amazon. We have two other authors coming as well. Um, they haven't confirmed yet, I don't believe, but it should be a lot of fun. So not an interview format next week, uh, but we'll still be here, so make sure you show up next week too. So. Well, thank you guys so much for having me this week. And thanks for coming on, Kendra. It was great talking to you. Good talking to you, too. Yeah, thanks a lot. I'm going to open that app right now. Um, if either of you two want in, just let me know in the chat. And then anyone else that's listening, if you want in, uh, just let us know in the comments. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>